So this is around 170 milliliters. That's a full glass that a fetus is drinking this much in a day of its own amniotic fluid. I told y'all I was gonna geek out in this video. Hey y'all, welcome back. I'm Mama Dr. Jones, a board certified OBGYN, a mom for, and I'm so excited about today's video. You've seen the title, it's Fascinating Fetal Facts, and the reason I'm so excited about it is because I genuinely love fetal physiology, embryology, anatomy, all of those things, and I love teaching them to you. I had so much fun looking up information for this video. I hope that y'all like the video as much as I enjoyed making it. If you're new here and you'd like to stick around, hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications so you never miss an upload. Let's jump into the video. Fascinating fetal fact number one, around eight weeks, they are the size and shape of a gummy bear. I'm not going to lie. I wanted to include this one purely so that I could go buy my favorite gummy bears and show you. So how do we know this? Utilizing fetal espionage or what some of you may call ultrasound, we can actually measure a fetus on the inside and see how long it is, but we also get an idea of what they look like. Around eight to nine weeks, they are about 20 millimeters in length. And we measure that using something called crown rump length, which is from the top of the head to the bottom of the bottom, from the head to the butt. And that just happens to correlate almost exactly with the size of a gummy bear or around two centimeters. Not to mention they have tiny little arm buds, tiny little leg buds, just the start of formation of limbs that look just like the limbs on a gummy bear. I'll throw an ultrasound comparison up on the screen so that you can see. If you're one of my patients, I know some of you watch this, then you've probably heard me say this in clinic before because it's one of my favorite things to tell people at their eight or nine week visit that baby is the size and shape of a gummy bear because it just gives you a little bit of an idea of what's going on in there and how big they are. Fascinating field fact number two is that they actually breathe in amniotic fluid to develop their lungs. That's right, something that would kill you breathing in water once you are born is 100% required in utero to have lung development. So think about lungs like an upside down tree branch. This is where my tree branch comes in and I pruned it down just a little bit after I got it and it it's a little sparse on this side, but I think it still makes it for a decent uh, explanation. <laughs> From about week seven to 24 of pregnancy, the lungs are really developing their structural shape, meaning they're kind of growing into that tree branch. So if you imagine at first it's just a tube, it branches into two, those get more branches, and then the leaves on the outside are the alveoli. That's kind of what's going on from seven to 24 weeks. And this process highly relies on mechanical stimulation inside the lungs, meaning the baby is expected to breathe in fluid help to expand that mechanically and push it to keep growing to create lungs and all of the oxygenation space that they will eventually need. So fluid goes in, stretches everything out, fluid comes out over and over and over from week seven to 24, and eventually that creates lungs. And let me remind you that you're expecting your lungs to work immediately upon birth, even though for the last 38 weeks, they've been completely submerged in water. Because remember, on the inside, your lungs don't have anything to do with gas exchange. All of that is going on at the level of the placenta when you're a fetus. Despite that, you still come out and expect them to work right away. So you can imagine, as I'm describing this to you, that if there was not amniotic fluid around the fetus during these key times, that their lungs won't even develop. And that's exactly what happens in a situation with anhydramnios or a lack of amniotic fluid. This is called pulmonary hypoplasia and it's just failure of lung development related oftentimes to a lack of fluid around the fetus. And this can happen for a variety of reasons. Some of the more common reasons are somebody's water breaking way too early or renal agenesis, meaning the fetus never developed any kidneys. So I just told you, if the fetus never develops kidneys, then there may not be any amniotic fluid around them. Why? What do kidneys have to do with creation of amniotic fluid? Well, that brings us to our next fascinating fetal fact, which is that amniotic fluid is basically fetus pee. Let me back up. So actually starting in the early second trimester or late first trimester, most of the amniotic fluid is fetal pee. Prior to that, there is fluid and we're not actually 100% sure where it even comes from. Even in an anembryonic gestation, which is a pregnancy that never actually develops a fetus or embryo, you may have heard it called a blighted ovum, the gestational sac still has fluid in it. So we know early on that this fluid is not coming from the fetus itself. However, after about week nine to 10, the kidneys start their rudimentary functioning and the fetus starts drinking the fluid that it had 
and peeing out more. I'm gonna throw in an ultrasound video here of my baby Pax when he was a tiny fetus learning how to swallow. And I was really, really lucky to catch this on ultrasound and I am so thankful I have it because it's such a great video. And you can see that he's opening his mouth, taking in fluid, swallowing. Eventually that will go down to his kidneys and he will put it into his bladder and then pee it out. And that's the continual process of creating amniotic fluid after about the ninth to 10th week when the kidneys finally start functioning a little bit. So by 30 weeks, a fetus is actually drinking about 170 milliliters of fluid a day and peeing out up to 40 milliliters of fluid per hour. That may not sound like a lot to you, but let me show you how much it is and then explain to you how much we actually pee out. So I'm gonna show you using this syringe, it holds about two milliliters of fluid how much exactly 40 milliliters of urine per hour that a fetus is peeing out by the third trimester actually is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I should have bought a bigger syringe. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 15, 14, 15, 16, 17. It's gonna overflow. 18, 19, 20. That is 40 milliliters of fluid. This is a full little, I guess shot glass of, of, of fetal pee. <laughs> I think that's crazy. Now let me make this make sense to you. If you were in the hospital and we were monitoring your urine output as an adult, this would be an acceptable amount of urine per hour to know that your kidneys were functioning fine. I know it's so wild to me that a fetus at 30 plus weeks is peeing about that much in an hour. Now, let's look at how much amniotic fluid they are swallowing over the course of a day. I'm going to show you how much they drink in a day, which is around 170 milliliters, 80, 120. So this is around 170 milliliters. That's a full glass that, a fetus is drinking this much in a day of its own amniotic fluid. I told y'all I was gonna geek out in this video because I love this so much, but that is so incredibly fascinating to me. It's so incredibly fascinating to me that they drink their fluid, they create more by peeing it out and they replenish their own amniotic fluid. And in the process, they're learning how to swallow, they're learning how to breathe. With that lung development that I told you about in the last one, it's, it's wild. I love it so much. This process of swallowing and creating pee can be very sensitive too. So if anything goes wrong at any of the levels of creation of urine, this can lead to major issues in the fetus as well. So if there's placental insufficiency, if there's heart problems, if there's problems with swallowing, problems with the kidneys, problems with urine output, posterior urethral valves, which keep the urine from actually coming out after it gets into the bladder. All of these things can cause major issues that have downstream effects. There has to be fluid to develop the lungs. There has to be kidneys to develop the fluid. All of these things are really important. So all of these processes are really sensitive. And to me, that says it is absolutely miraculous that any of us learn to function as a fetus and then at birth, learn to function as not a fetus anymore. It's wild. So they're in there drinking their own fluid, peeing it out, drinking it again, breathing it in to develop their lungs, but what else are they doing? For the next fascinating fetal fact, we're going to talk about fetal sleep. That's right, they sleep. In fact, about 20 minutes out of every hour, they will be awake, and most of the other time, they are sleeping. Sometimes even up for 50 minutes at a time, they will take naps. The closer you get to term, the more a fetus sleeps, and actually by the time you are full term, they're spending like 95% of their day asleep. Now, importantly, that does not mean that no movement or decreased movement is normal as you get to term. They still move during periods of sleep. And if you feel like your baby is not moving or moving less, you need to let your doctor or midwife know. Around 26 to 28 weeks, you can actually start to see on ultrasound their eyes doing that classic movement that we associate with REM sleep. It's really interesting to watch on ultrasound. But even more interesting than that is you can wake them up. I know, I know, you're never supposed to wake a sleeping baby, but sometimes when we do something called a non-stress test where we're monitoring the fetal heart rate, 
we need to make sure that the heart rate looks like it does. We're looking for various patterns because the fetus is asleep and not because it is in danger. When we're looking at a fetal heart strip, we're looking for a baseline that's in the normal range, which would be somewhere between about 120 and 160. We're looking for it to move around like this. That's called variability. You don't want it to be a flat line. And we're also looking for something called accelerations. Sometimes when you're monitoring, they may not have accelerations because they are sleeping, or it may be because they are in danger of some kind. And so we can delineate that either by just continuing to monitor for an extended period of time for a couple of hours, or by doing something called vibroacoustic stimulation to wake them up out of that sleep state. And this is basically just a little vibrating tool that you put on the belly. And usually after you do that, they wake up, they start kicking around more and you start seeing those accelerations in their heart rate. And you can say, yep, everything looks great. It's okay for you to go home. The next fascinating fetal fact is actually about their head. Fetuses actually have skull bones, which are not connected. If you fill your head, it shouldn't move around. Your skull is one piece, but a fetus, not one piece. In fact, a newborn when they are born has about 94 more bones than you have when you reach adulthood. Over time, they fuse together to form that 206 bones that make up a normal human adult skeleton. As far as the fetal skull is concerned, you have two frontal bones, two parietal bones, and an occipital bone, and they are connected with something called sutures. And in those suture lines is some fibrinous material that allows a little bit of flexibility in the skull. And the reason for this is twofold. So you need to be able to move the skull around a little bit as you're coming through the birth canal so that it doesn't injure you. And you have to be able to allow for growth of the brain. In those first years of life, a baby is growing its brain at a rapid pace. And if the skull couldn't expand, then that wouldn't be able to happen. So those sutures and the fibrinous material in them allow for expansion of the skull until the brain reaches its normal size. Over time, that fibrinous material in the sutures is replaced by hard bone. And you eventually get to the point where your skull is what I hope y'all's is like now and doesn't move around. You also have two fontanelles, an anterior and posterior fontanelle. Y'all might know these as a soft spot. The anterior one here closes by the time you're about two, and the posterior one back here closes about three months after you're born. Those serve the same purpose, to allow for growth and expansion of the skull as the brain gets bigger. And you can actually see on an adult human skull the suture lines from where that fibrinous material was replaced and created their normal full skull that is one bone. Which interestingly, we also use to tell what position that a fetal head is in during the birth process because you can identify where each of those sutures are and decide which way the fetus is facing. So you might have heard me say something called OP or occiput posterior. What that is referencing is this occipital bone in the fetal skull and where it is facing in relation to the person giving birth. So if the occiput is posterior, that means baby's coming up face up, sunny side up, stargazer, not the way we really like them to come out, but still okay. And if we say occiput anterior, it's facing the floor, which is a little bit easier way to give birth. If that fusion of the skull bones happens too early, so those sutures and their pliable material holding them together are replaced by hard bone too soon, you get a condition called craniosynostosis. And this causes the brain and skull to grow in a misshapen way and doesn't allow for optimal growth. If it happens in utero, it can be really dangerous as well. For our next fascinating fetal fact, we are getting into the nitty gritty of circulation because their circulation is completely different on the inside than it is on the outside. And the first breath they take drastically alters the way that their blood flows through their body. That's right, they have completely different circulatory system than you and I. And that's where my handy dandy whiteboard comes in. I'm gonna draw it out for you. Basically what you're looking at here is the placenta is serving as the gas exchange in a fetus. So instead of having oxygenated blood going into the body from the heart, you have oxygenated blood leaving the placenta through umbilical veins, so through the umbilical cord, it basically bypasses the liver, some goes to the liver, but because all of the exchange to remove toxins and stuff is done at the level of the placenta, they don't have to send all of the blood through their liver to get cleaned out. And it goes through the ductus venosus, which is not something that we have once we are on the outside, and I'll explain to you what happens to it. And then through the inferior vena cava, which remember, 
in somebody who is functioning on the outside, this is not oxygenated blood, but on the fetal side, it is oxygenated blood to the right side of the heart. Now we already have oxygenated blood, so we don't have to go to the lungs. We bypass the lungs through a hole in the heart called the foramen ovale. So oxygenated blood bypasses the lungs. A little bit goes there just for the tissues to be healthy, but it doesn't go there to get oxygenated. It got its oxygen here at the placenta and then out into the aorta and to the body. So it, it totally bypasses or mostly bypasses the liver and lungs because they don't have to function like they do when you're on the outside. Goes to the body, now you have deoxygenated blood, it's going through the umbilical cord in the umbilical arteries and back to the placenta to reoxygenate, reclean, and come back and do it all again. So how does it go from that to what we have on the outside? Because it has to happen fast. When you are on the inside, the vascular resistance inside the lungs is really high. Blood, like all liquids, takes the path of least resistance. The path of least resistance is going to be going through that foramen ovale and that ductus arteriosus instead of through the pulmonary vasculature. However, when you come out and you take that first deep breath, there's a massive drop in the vascular resistance inside of the lungs. And what that does is create a pressure system that closes the foramen ovale in the heart. So that hole in the heart goes away. Now, things can go wrong. Sometimes people have to have these surgically fixed, but in a perfectly functioning system, which most of us have, that immediately closes, the ductus arteriosus closes. Part of that has to do with a drop in prostaglandins, which is a hormonal response, but those two close. And then how does the ductus venosus, which bypasses the liver close? Well, if you will remember, the umbilical vein is what was feeding that. What happens after you're born? The cord is clamped and cut and stops flowing. This also creates a sudden pressure change and closes the ductus venosus. The fact that you have a completely different way that your circulatory system functions that changes immediately when you breathe in at birth is incredible to me, mind blowing. I know I told y'all I was gonna geek out this whole video and I'm doing it. I just really hope that one of you likes this video as much as I do. Moving on to our final fascinating fetal fact for this video and that is sometimes they have teeth. Not just the teeth that exist under your gums that you have when you are born, but actual teeth. This is called a natal tooth and occasionally a baby will be born with a tooth that has erupted during the fetal stage. It usually is not problematic. It's usually just a random thing. I've seen it a couple of times. It can occasionally be associated with really rare syndromes that I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce, but most of the time it's not harmful. As long as it's not loose or causing problems with nursing or causing cuts on the tongue or anything like that, it's usually just left there and baby got their first tooth a little bit early. All right, y'all, that's it for today. I hope that you geeked out and love this fascinating fetal fact video as much as I do. If you're not subscribed and you wanna be, hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications so you never miss an upload and I will see you next Monday. This is not my house and I don't have hardly anything here that I can use for my demonstrations. So I'm gonna run to the store. Y'all can come with me if you want. Hi, yeah, so I changed clothes, obviously, because I'm not above putting on a scrub top to film a video, but I am absolutely not going to the dollar store in my scrubs. I'm gonna run in and get some supplies so that we can get this video done. I have never been so excited about a video. Maybe the vaginal discharge video, but I love this topic. Let's go. I got our supplies. I need to stop one more place and get one more thing and then go home and film this video. Also, there's a dog out here and I am definitely a dog person, but oh, a week or two ago, I got attacked by a gang of schnauzers and one of them jumped from the ground all the way up and bit me on the arm. Can't, the bruising is almost gone, but I had to go get antibiotics because I have a puncture wound from its tooth there. So I have weird anxiety about dogs now and there's just a dog out here staring at me. It's threatening me. So I'm, I'm gonna go and I'll see you in a minute for one more stop and then home for this video.
All right, we have all of our things. Now we can actually jump into the video. 